Well, what I'm going to present is going to be part of my PhD research project. And like mentioned before, it's going to be about the detection of potential dispersal behavior and radio movement paths, especially with an application for modeling landscape resistance towards movement. So I will do it from here. Okay, so I will start with a short explanation about what is functional connectivity, because not everyone might be uh, familiar with this term. So if we take a look at landscape connectivity, we have to defer between structural and functional connectivity. Whereas, for example, <coughs> structural connectivity would take into account existing corridors of one habitat type that is connecting other existing habitats. Whereas functional connectivity uh, also takes into account that species might be able to move through hostile habitats or inhabitable, uh, inhabitable uh, landscapes. Maybe give there some stepping stones like in here. Or actually a species might be able to cross barriers and still the landscape would be connected. So as we can see here, I think it's pretty obvious that this needs to be evaluated at a species-specific uh, species level. So the one species might be able to cross the road, the other one maybe is not. So this is kind of uh, important. And also to sum it all up, uh, functional connectivity does include the movement or dispersal of the organisms from one point to another, but also the su successful reproduction at the new established habitats. So we can say it's actually representing gene flow. So how far can we now model the landscape connectivity, especially the functional connectivity of a landscape? And this is usually done by modeling or quantifying landscape resistance towards movement of the organism in focus. And that's basically uh, assigning to different types or different structures in the habitat or in the landscape a value whether it's high or low resistance towards <coughs> the movement of the organism. And this is mostly done by using expert knowledge or looking at the literature. Also, another very popular option is to use um, habitat suitability mo models and also simulations and experiments. And experiments, of course, are quite limited by the size of the organism I'm, I'm looking at. And that's the reason why I'm here. Of course, telemetry data has a really good potential for telling us what is an organism really looking for, a colored individual, how it is behaving, what parts of the landscape are important, which ones are selected which ones are avoided. And with this information, we can actually model landscape resistance. And let's suppose we just try a whole different options of modeling landscape resistance, and we have a whole bunch of models. So how far do we know that this model really represents functional connectivity? So this is where landscape genetics come in handy, which basically is a correlation of landscape effects with population genetics, or define correlations between landscape structures and genetic structures. And in this example, that would mean that uh, we could use our uh, resistance surface we just have developed and look at the effective dif distances between uh, populations of our uh, species and correlate these effective distances that are based on this surface with genetic distances that we got also from samples from the same area, or from the same region, and see which one of my models best represents also the genetic distances, uh, distances that I observed. So this makes a lot of sense, I think, because with populations that are quite closely um, um, in terms of uh, the effective distances in, uh, between them, you can also expect that there's a higher rate of gene flow, whereas other populations that are far apart or even uh, disrupted by a barrier would show low signs of genetic flow or even none is more existent. So this is a way how to evaluate the landscape, gen uh, the landscape the resistance models. This is basically also what I'm doing in most of my research. Come up with different methods to develop those uh, resistant surfaces and use genetic data to uh, evaluate and how well they do perform. And the species of focus I'm looking at is a red deer in northern Germany. Uh, it's one of the largest free roaming mammals we have in Germany, but especially in this area of northern Germany, it's basically a uh, due to landscape fragmentation, uh, split up into eight subpopulations with more or less poorly existing uh, connectivity in between, which is also detected by genetic variability, which is quite low compared to other European populations. And also, we have some subpopulations that already show signs of inbreeding, which is sh shown by shortened lower jaws, which would actually go up to here, usually. So this is actually something that is um, showing up in some of the populations there. And 
therefore, there was a research project started to actually find or develop mitigation measures like developing corridors for uh, promoting dispersal movements between those populations or in conflicts with roads, maybe come up with um, good spots for green bridges or wildlife crossings. And throughout this research project, we were able to get um, GPS rig location data of 23 individuals from all over the place in that region. And in total, we had over 85,000 uh, relocations available. And with this data, we can now model or develop uh, landscape resistance models. But um, I just didn't want to take all of the data. This is examples of a really travel happy individual that we had and just take plain all of the data, but kind of try to figure out how I can segment this entire path into smaller bits and pieces, and leave out all these main little small movements in the habitat or in the, in the perfect habitat where it is staying for a long time, but rather find those segments that are in between which might be potentially dispersal movements. And later on, once I found these segments, I wanted to link them to the habitat and apply a resource selection function. And um, in comparison to a step selection function, I actually did it at the path level, which means I compared the entire path with randomly distributed path. And this is kind of the difference to a step selection. And also this path, uh, this type of analysis is what has been recommended lately by other uh, researchers too, especially for estimating the resistance to what's movement. So this is what I did entirely. First of all, I applied a behavioral change point analysis to find different segments of different behavior within this movement path. And these paths were sec uh, then uh, clustered in order to identify those segments that are actually potentially dispersal movements and applied the before I mentioned the, the path selection analys analysis with these segments, and later on used uh, conditional logistic regression for linking these paths uh, with habitat variables. And furthermore, this information then was used to develop uh, resistance or so-called cost surfaces. And I'm going to show that in more detail later on. Uh, all these analyses were performed in, in R. And to start with the behavioral change point analysis, or short uh, BCPA, which was developed by Rory and colleagues in 2009, which is basically a moving window approach, uh, which goes along a time series model of the persistent velocity of the entire path of an individual. And persistent velocity basically is, um, if you keep in mind all the characteristics you can design or uh, look at of a certain movement path, like angle, step lengths, and so forth, the persistent velocity would be the cosine of the relative angle between two steps times the velocity. And it basically tells us in how far this movement has the tendency to, to keep heading in the same direction and not is it turning backwards or in the other opposite direction. And what it does, or this te technique does, it detects um, significant uh, changes in this movement behavior and gives you some certain break, break points. It would be like the gray lines in here. And you can use these break points now to split up the paths in smaller segments. And within the segments, you have some different type of behavior but this method doesn't tell you what kind of behavior this might be. So now you have to figure out how to tell what it might be. So I characterized all the little path segments, like this examples for these two ones here, and char uh, characterized them by looking at the number of steps, the total length of the segment, the sinuosity of the segment, or the mean persistent velocity within the segment. And then I used a clustering approach, a k-means algorithm, with to find four different clusters within these variables. So for example, this would look like this. We have four clusters here for our number of steps and for the segment length and the sinuosity. And then I would take the uh, standardized median for each variable and sum it up. So I get an index value, which tells us which cluster potentially might be the one with the potential dispersal movement. In this case, it's the number two, which is the highest number of steps within each cluster. Uh, which <coughs> within this cluster, also the segments with the highest length, and also with the fairly highest sinuosity. So that way, I could find, this is also the same example, the past segments that are most potentially dispersal movement, whereas the other ones are some type of other movement behavior. Once I found those segments, I applied the technique that also is performed by Redding and Al last year published 
um, to do this path selection analysis, which basically means that I have the original path segment in red here and redistributed randomly 10 times in a uh, radius of five kilometers, but keeping the same path structure as the observed one. And once I've done that, I can buffer it. For example, the blue one is a 100 meter buffer, or the green one is a 500 meter buffer. And these buffers are needed to actually link this path to a habitat. So I measured the proportion of different habitat variables within those buffers. And the variables I reconsidered were um, agricultural landscapes, um, forested areas, heath or more like, moor like areas, edge rows, which are historical or cultural artifact in this area, but meant to be really important for the dispersal movement of red deer. And of <coughs> course, roads, urban areas, and water. And now to statistically link this all together, I use uh, conditional logistic regression, which actually compares the habitat variables within the buffers of the one chosen path segment and the 10 random ones. And it models, or it counts for um, the clustering in the data, therefore um, the data or the, it's conditional upon the path sets I really used in that, so I don't get a, an intercept as a model output. And uh, applied a multivariate model approach containing all the habitat variables, explanatory variables, and also a jackknife approach to, to estimate the coefficients because I have used different individuals that might bias or influence my results because every individual might have different behavior. So that's why I use a jackknife approach to estimate the coefficients. And the results or the coefficients were also integrated in a pair selection function, which is comparable to the um, step selection function we have seen before. And it gives us an index of selectivity and how far a path might be preferred compared to another. It ranks a value between zero for not selected until one, which means this path is most likely to be selected. And this function now then are used to actually develop those uh, resistant surfaces of the landscape uh, to design different parts of the landscape, a uh, cost value between zero, which means that it's really low resistant and very high resistance means a value of 100 that would uh, really um, be the highest cost you can assign. So I will show you later on what it looks like in the results. So in total, I ended up while applying this BCPA with 744 segments of potentially dispersal movement. And the segments were around 32 per animal, but highly variable. Uh, in the mean, we had six um, uh, steps per uh, segment. And also, each segment, the mean was around seven kilometers long. And the conditional logistic regression showed us that mostly um, agriculture, forest, and uh, these heath like or more areas had positive influence and everything else. Also, interesting, those heteros <coughs> had negative effects. And this also had a little bit of changing, especially when you apply the jack knife approach to, to model those coefficients but still mostly a positive influence of agriculture and forested areas, whereas all the other variables had negative effects with very varying degrees. So that means if you look at the proportion of forest and keep all other uh, variables at the observed mean, you can say that the selectivity of a path is increasing with higher proportions of forest within the buffer and with decreasing urbanization within the buffer. And this would be the example for the so-called cost surface or resistance surface, which has, like I said before, a value between zero no resistance until 100. And especially the roads, these linear structures have a very high value of resistance. This, for example, is also a town, which has a high value of resistance. Forests like this have a low value of resistance. And then you have a lot of stuff in between that are intermediate areas of resistance. Now we can take um, this is also the mo most um, or main areas where red deer occur and take the surface to actually calculate a coast or least coast path along this uh, resistant surface, which can also serve as effective distances for later on correlating it with genetic data from the same areas. So that way you can see where potentially also some um, dispersal corridors might exist. So, so far for the application, just a short discussion and outlook, where I think the BCPA is a really valuable tool for segmenting a path into different behavior modes and 
still, in my example, it's quite critical to link those to the habitat variables, especially if you take into account that the intervals between those uh, relocations are six hours. So in six hours, a lot of things can happen, especially with the mobile species like red deer. So in the future, I plan to apply other methods to actually link those path segments to habitat variables. And like I said before, a lot of indications before showed that those hedgerows that I mentioned are actually or supposed to have a positive effect on the movement of this species. So I might have to reconsider other methods how to implement the information of this habitat variable in the analysis. So that's the outlook, what I'm going to try in the near future. Especially I want to try different methods for segmenting a path besides the BCPA. There are um, Bayesian state space models come, to, come up to my mind, for example. And like I said before, also optimize the linking of the habitat variables to the path, e.g. also try step selection maybe, but also Brownian bridge movement models. And currently I have over 300 red deer genetic samples from that area that will also increase over the next winter, which I'm going to use to define um, genetic distances between those areas and link that to the effective distances based on the developed cost grids and try to find out which approach best describes the genetic uh, structure I find in my data or I found in my data and maybe also can propose which methods are really valuable and applicable for other projects that have the same topic of interest. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. I thank also my colleagues and all the people that supported me and I'm really looking forward to answer some questions. Yeah. Well, figure it's generosity tells us how straightforward the movement is. So is it's not really curvy. Well, it was just an approach because I would figure, okay, if it's dispersing, it's going pretty much straightforward than rather just. A low, a low rate of control. Correlation with control. Isn't the high value does mean that the path is fairly straight. Okay. Yeah, and the low value means that the, okay. the path is fairly well, curvy, so, yeah. Thank you. Yep.